Father, we thank you, Lord, for your amazing love for us, God. We thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives, God. We thank you that um, you continue to reveal yourself to us. You continue to bring us into your world, into your life, into your kingdom, and uh, <clears throat> introduce us to new things, um, about you and we're just so uh, excited for the adventure that we're on with you and so tonight I guess I, I pray Father that um, that as we complete this class on unity Father that uh, your Holy Spirit would, would flow through us that um, you'll capture our hearts with your uh, desire and uh, that, that we would leave this class um, determined to be part of the unifying force within your body, God. And uh, I just ask you to bless this class, bless each of the people that have been here over these three weeks. And, um, and I pray, Father, that uh, even as uh, I complete this book, God, that you'll... Um, you help me uh, to honor you with it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hello. All right. So we're going to, um, this is the last class on uh, Unity Transforming Community. We'll talk a little bit about that actual title near the end, near the conclusion part. Um, but we're going to start this session with um, kind of a little bit about some of the difficulties with unity. Um, I mean, we know that the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that the enemy works over time to keep us uh, divided, you know. So his, um, I got my water here too. Um, you know, he's certainly not working together with uh, with God to try to help God get his, you know, his will accomplished, you know. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just like he used the scripture with Jesus to try to throw Jesus off track, there's a lot of times scripture gets used um, to increase dis uh, division within the church, you know, in a lot of ways. Uh, we talked about it at the beginning a little bit about denominationalism and and doctrinal uh, stances and things like that and things that we use uh, the scripture as as people to end up dividing us and and keeping us kind of separated. Um, but there's some there's some actual scriptures that give us there are times when division or separation is necessary. And although uh, in my topic, I don't like these scriptures all that much, truthfully. <laughs> um, and I don't want to try to take the scripture and, and twist it or anything like that. But, but there, because there are literally um, in times that we need to say to someone else that's uh, in a meeting with us or, or part of our group, we need to say... I, I need to separate from you. And that, that sounds like a weird thing within unity, but if we don't, if we don't address that, then there's this, this elephant in the room, so to speak, uh, and, 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 or, or we just begin to accept things that are not from God. Um, so I want to talk about a few of those things in this first part, and maybe we'll, we'll have some discussion about it. Um, uh, but there's this, there's this thing called heresy <laughs> that um, in the church been, you know, it, it's been since, since scriptural times till now, most of, the, most of the things that are heretical that come up in the church are, you can trace them back to some of the basic several things, uh, the heretical things that were happening then. I think I mentioned uh, last week or the week before about um, there were there were some real 
issues with regard to whether Jesus was God or was Jesus man or or what was going on. They were working out the Trinity, you know. We have a lot of these things kind of settled in our own minds now, you know, um, because somebody settled them at some point and, you know, we were taught those things. Um, but there is there are things that get taught in churches uh, or to church groups of some sort or whole groups that form around untruths. They're not, they're not formed on truth. There are, there are doctrinal statements that are, are not formed on truth. They're, they're, and they're what we would call heretical. There's orthodox teaching, not to be confused necessarily with the orthodox church, but there's orthodox teaching. And really, we've talked about this, I think a lot of it can be found right, right in, the, uh, in some of the early creeds of the church. And then there's extra biblical teaching and there's different things. And there's a lot of, like, if, if there wasn't, if, if the Bible, there was this, um, there was this um, phrase, um, there's probably a better word for it, but called sola scriptura, only scripture, you know. Um, scripture is all that we go with. And, um, and that sounds really good. It sounds really spiritual and really a good thing. But not, most people don't really believe that Scripture is the only thing that we go by. Because really most of the church <laughs> isn't following a lot of the Scripture anyway. <laughs> um, we're doing a lot of things that weren't, aren't in Scripture. It never told us to... I'll bring up Christmas again. Never told us to celebrate Christmas, but we celebrate it. Never told us to have Sunday school, but we do it. Um, you know, never told us to build buildings, but we do it. And all those things are, I'm, I'm not saying anything that are, are bad, of those things are bad necessarily, but they're not from Scripture. We didn't find that in Scripture, and then out of Scripture we, we decided this is what we should do because Scripture gave us that instruction. So, so really most of the church doesn't do sola scriptura. And if, um, if it was just Scripture, then there's really not a whole lot of need for teaching. The only thing we would maybe need to teach would be let's figure out what the um, situation was uh, at the time when this letter was written so we can be, understand what was written in this letter and just talk about what they would have thought when they got this letter, <laughs> you know, um, uh, just so we could have an understanding 2,000 years later, what, what were they thinking? That's one of the best ways to, to begin to understand Scripture anyway, is to, to, to understand why was, this, why was this written to the people that it was written to. Um, what were they thinking when they first heard it? We can get it. We can throw a lot of junk out <laughs> if we begin with that when we're trying to understand what Scripture says. You know, um, I won't get into some of the things I think about that, but <laughs> that's a whole another probably a whole another class. But um, uh, so there's orthodox teaching, right? Remember, right thinking, orthodox. That I. I I think I said that the first week, but some of you may or may not have been here. Orthodox teaching, but and then there's heretical teaching. There's teaching that is not in line with what the scripture would teach. Um, uh, it, it's actually not just not in line, but it's out of line. It's contrary to what the scripture teaches. And um, uh, sometimes heretical teaching is and is accidental like they just misunderstand what scripture is saying and and they go with what they what they think it might have said or or again if we skip over the idea that this letter was written to a group of people 2000 years ago in a, in a very different culture and we go and we just take it to well what does it mean to me we may miss actually what it was what it's trying to say does that make sense is that okay so so um, you can write, I'm not going to read every one of these scriptures, but, you know, 2 Peter 2, 1, Acts 20, 30, both talk about heretical teaching, that heresies were going to come, arise, people were going to teach things that were not, were not truth. And you can read through, through a lot of the New Testament and see 
that there were people that literally came into a, uh, uh, a church meeting or whatever and and well I'll use this one for an, for an example uh, when Jews uh, when, when, when the gospel was opened up to Gentiles there were still a lot of Jews that didn't understand like that Gentiles could be saved or if they could be saved they certainly had to practice the law you know and so when people were coming they called them Judaizers right you know when when they would come in and they would teach that uh, you had to follow the law they weren't teaching orthodox teaching that was not what the church had agreed to was orthodox teaching the law was now fulfilled by Christ and 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 they ended up um, in one of the in one of the councils that they had in Jerusalem they end up having a very short list of things that were okay it seemed good to us in the Holy Spirit that, that the Gentiles should follow this this and this and then they sent that out to the churches I don't even know if all the churches actually got that information but um, but so so there there's all kinds and you you may have heard you may have heard heretical teaching before somewhere you know not here I'm sure but but uh, you know you may have run into somebody but but the problem with us deciding individuals deciding what's heretical and what's what's orthodox is that it's really ends up being up to what I think you know so uh, I don't I don't you know I think Bill Johnson's great I love I love to listen to Bill Johnson um, uh, or Mike Bickle or or some of these different ones but if you go online and search them there are people that say really really mean stuff about them you know and I think how you know they would call them heretical because of something they didn't agree with with what they said so it's like if we disagree all of a sudden that person becomes a heretic and I that's what we really need to guard against there are there are heretical teens it's real but not everything is heretical just because we don't agree with it or, or it's not what we got taught. Um, the, the scripture says in Acts 20, 20, uh, yeah, 20, 29 that savage wolves would come in, you know. Um, Matthew 24, 24 and Mark 13, 22 talks about false Christs. Now, that's, a, that's one of those scriptures that's speaking to a specific generation. Um, but still... False Christ, and if you read a little bit of Josephus, uh, which who was a historian at that time, you'll see that there were actually false Christs, people claiming to be Christ, uh, that was were coming around. Um, but now, I mean, so I, wh who's one of the most recent ones? David Koresh, maybe. I, you know, everybody remember David Koresh, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, act as as if he was Christ, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, um, there's false prophets. Matthew 24, 11 and Matthew 7, 15 talks about that. False teachers. Acts 20, 29, 2 Peter 2, 1 and 12 and Galatians 4, 17. False apostles. 2 Corinthians um, 11, 13. And I believe there was also that they talk about false apostles in Revelation. One of, one of the churches was dealing with false apostles. I can't remember which one. Um, we have uh, all those things the Bible warns us about. But we have to be very careful that we don't shift out of th these warnings. We don't take them and then become fearful. And then because when we start acting in fear, we stop acting in love. And that's, what's so, that's what happens so often in the church. When we start acting in fear, we stop acting in love. And you, it's uh, amazing. When I read some of these comments, say, we'll ba back up to... Uh, I don't, I don't remember if it was Jill, Bill Johnson or Mike Bickle. I had somebody send me one time because I mentioned um, IHOP mm -hmm. at, a, at a meeting one time. And uh, I got this email afterwards with all these, watch all these videos. And I just said, I don't watch those videos. <laughs> you know, I, I just don't watch those things. Um, because they were they were concerned that I was going to get thrown off because you know I I mentioned IHOP or something you know um, 
Uh, there are literal, actual people <laughs> that are that will come into the church at these times, and I'm glad we have warnings of that because I got to tell you, Christians are some of the most gullible people around. I mean, it's election time. Oh my goodness. Some of the stuff that gets shared on Facebook, you go, please, people, please check your sources. Check, <laughs> find out what you're sharing before you start sharing stuff. You, we look like idiots when we do stuff like this. You know, we we have to we have to check things out. We don't just we shouldn't just share something just because it agrees with our thinking and we oh well this agrees with what I think so I'm going to share it as if it's a fact. When you have no idea if it's a fact or not, you know. Um, and that's what happens sometimes within the church. We'll do things like that. But then there are literal, there are actual people, sa like savage wolves, like, like Paul said, or might, might have been Luke, um, that will, will actually come into a situation, into a church, and try to draw people away. Because that's what, that's what they're there for. Because, just because that's a, that's, that's a truth doesn't mean we're supposed to be afraid. It's just a warning for us to be aware. We should never be afraid of the devil or anybody working with the devil, <laughs> uh, any demons. We don't have to ever be afraid of any of that because greater is in he that's in us than he that's in the world, right? So um, there are reasons to separate. We talk about you've heard of the guy who was sleeping with his stepmother in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. They said, deal with this guy. You actually feel proud of it. Now this is, this is the thing where we get, we get ourselves in a mess because we want to be so loving. You know, we call it love. And we actually allow, Jesus warned about the leaven of the Pharisees and, the, and, and of Herod, right? We allow... Uh, somebody to remain in a situation because we just don't know how to deal with it. Now we have litigation. We have all these different things we're, we're concerned about and we begin to act in fear rather than dealing with it. So Paul was saying, hey, this guy needs to be dealt with. He, you need to do something. In fact, you need to separate yourself from this guy. Uh, now the cool thing is that we get the follow-up story in 2 Corinthians. And it says, he, now, this is, this is a whole different thing. And this, uh, l l let me back up just a second. Um, the church was a family. <laughs> the church loved one another. We, they were devoted to one another. They, you know, I mean, there were, there were problems that were being dealt with, but the, the, um, the general idea of the church and the and the I and and the um, the characteristic of the early church was was oneness, and so to separate somebody from from a congregation was was a penalty. Was like if this is your family, and now you're being told because you because you've been warned, you're being told we're going to have to separate from you. That 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 wasn't a Ha ha! We get to separate from you. That was that was sad, on but and and it should have been sad on both both sides. And the idea was that it would cause the guy to repent and come back. Well, in Second Corinthians, we see that he's allowed. Then they're they're encouraged. Okay, he's he's had enough. Like he's repentant. It, you know, it doesn't give us all the detail of. It. I wish it gave us a little more detail of it. Some of it we have to speculate and and and. and um, try to understand but he was allowed to come back into the congregation um, and and I'm assuming it was because he was repentant it doesn't say that he repented um, uh, if you if you ever uh, want to see uh, how, a, a good example of how the church should deal with sin within its ranks um, read culture of honor by Danny Silk, or listen to some of the teachings from Danny Silk. Do that unfortunately. Are you? Oh, good. Yeah, because the way they deal with people that are 
caught in sin <laughs> is so much more like Jesus than like, the, like what I've seen the church deal with those things. But they do have to be dealt with because otherwise, not only are you allowing that person to be hurt themselves and whoever, whoever's involved, you're allowing that influence to be on the church and it's confusion. And we're not supposed to bring confusion to people. So, um, so you, sometimes, now, now somebody might use that story and say, well, this person did such and such, I'm going to disassociate from them. Well, I can say that sleeping with your stepmother is a pretty serious situation. <laughs> you know, it's not like, oh, he didn't smile at me, you know, on Sunday, or, or he, you know, he has a different thought on this, on this Greek word, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> things that we will separate and, and divide over. Um, so we have to be careful what we decide is a, a matter that needs to be dealt with in such a way, and that's why there's elders in the church to help deal with those kinds of things. I thought you were... Well, Sin, yeah, be yeah. Continual lifestyle it has to be confronted, mm -hmm. and if not re receive correction, then yeah, go through it. And the Bible just says, "Give him over to the devil." Yeah, mm -hmm. for the yeah. destruction of the flesh. Of the flesh. So, so that. So that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Receive so, that. so the ultimately, it's for restoration. It's not just to pen penalize the person. It's for restoration. Ultimately. Uh, separation in, in these circumstances are for restoration. Most of the time what you'll find is when people want to separate is because they're offended in some way. Not for the, the good of the person that they want to separate from. So we have to be careful. What is our motivation when these things are happening? Um, the, the other, uh, another thing is divisive people. One of the, one of the very, the, the most serious um, situations as far as dividing from people or separating yourself from people in the scripture is a divisive person in, in Titus 3 9 and 10 uh, I, and I I didn't I didn't put this in here and I didn't open my Bible up I'm sorry I, I have several scriptures actually written out in here but um, I believe it says warn a divisive person once and then warn them again and the third time have nothing to do with them like it's like you're, you're telling them, it's kind of like the Matthew 18, you know, go to the person. You, know, you don't see this happen very often in church either. <laughs> go to the person. If, if that doesn't work, uh, if, they're, if, if, if they won't, you know, you can't work it out, just the two of you. So often that first step never happens. Yeah. And instead of going to the person, we go to somebody else. <laughs> um, who likes us? Who, who likes us? Who will agree with us? You know, and we ask them to pray for this person, this terrible person. No. <laughs> um, and then, and then it says, take uh, some elders with you and go back to the person again and see if that works. And then you're supposed to take them before the church. Now, I don't know if I've ever seen that happen. Um, uh, and I think a lot of times it's fear because of because of lit litigation New Jersey. It used to be, I don't know if it still is, but it used to be one of the most litigious uh, states uh, for in church litigation. Oh, yeah. yeah. Either, either somebody's suing a church or, or the church suing somebody or church is suing each other or them suing a district or whatever. Uh, it used to be one of the most litigious things. And just, and that's, that's an excellent example. The scriptures, Paul is like, he'd be like horrified, yeah, mortified of, from there, he's like, can't you find anybody within your church that's wise enough to deal with these matters? Don't you realize that one day you're going to judge the world? <laughs> you know, you can't even figure some of this stuff out, you know? Um, I guess what my good, one of my pastor friends in this area have been sued a few times for, you know, laying on hands of people falling. Mm, yeah, yeah. There's probably people that just come just to fall uh, so they can sue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but there are divisive, when the scripture's clear, and again, I, it doesn't go into a lot of detail about this, but I believe it would be very similar to where we had to separate from the guy in Corinth. He's talking to Titus, who was a church leader, and, and uh, it doesn't tell us exactly what he does, but um, 
Uh, I'm sure he was appointing elders. He was dealing with certain certain matters. He was probably over several congregations. Um, and, and so he's teaching him some of the things to do. Like, you need to deal with these things. Now, he, was, he sent this to Titus, who was a church elder of some sort, probably an apostle. Right, Titus an apostle? I don't, I don't really remember, but uh, it's a good question. Okay, this is a question <laughs> for, for later. Um, <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and he was telling him how to deal with these matters. So it wasn't like anybody could just decide a person was divisive. It had to be something that was decided among the eldership and say, okay, well, let's, let's talk about this matter. It says warn them once, warn them again, and then if they, if they continue to be divisive, because unity is the goal, if they continue to be divisive, then separate yourself. Have nothing to do with them, I think it says. So, um, and then, you know, this seems like something that, you know, there's a lot of things in Scripture that, that don't seem nice to us in our culture. You know, like, like if, if you're, if you're um, giving a prof- uh, if you're giving a prophecy and somebody else starts to prophesy, the first person prophesying is supposed to be quiet and let the other person go. That just seems like, like, I've never seen that happen in a church either. <laughs> because it does, culturally, it doesn't make sense to us, you know. Um, but also, Paul in, uh, to Timothy names a couple guys. He, he names them. He says, these two guys were causing problems in the church. And we got rid of them, you know. So I think we have to, we ha- there are times when... Um, when we do have to separate from other people that would say, I'm part of the church. Um, it should be done, it, sh- it should not be a happy occasion. <laughs> it shouldn't be, oh, good riddance, you know. I'm glad we finally got rid of them. They were sure a troublemaker, you know. Um, it, should, it should never be a happy occasion because, because we, ha- we know from, from John 17 and from other places that unity and oneness is God's goal for his body. So when we have to do that, it's, it should be not the way I've seen it done so often in the church. I literally had, I, I had a situation um, one time where I had to ask a person to not come back to, to the church. Now, the, the problem with our culture today is that if... A church leader tells somebody, don't come back to this church. All they got to do is go down the street and talk bad about you or whatever. Yeah, or maybe not. Um, But all they have to do is, and more than likely, that new pastor is not going to call you and say, hey, what's going on? This guy says he's from your church. Or sometimes they may not tell them. But you got to know they were somewhere, (laughs) you know. And and there's... um, so, so, so a divisive person doesn't actually get kicked out of the church, so to speak. They, they just go to another church and become divisive there, <laughs> um, unfortunately. So, so there's a lot of things to work out with some of these things in our culture. In our, because we're so divided now, um, it, some of these things are more difficult to deal with and handle in a, in a, in a way that's honoring to God and honoring to us to the church, the body of Christ. Um, but they, they have to be. And it, so I don't have all the answers on how to, how to deal with some of these things. But I do want to recognize that there are times when we, are suppo- we have to say to somebody, we're not going to let you continue to practice a habitual sin that we've warned you several times about. We're not going to allow you to continue to be divisive within this congregation. Um, uh, and, and we do have to do that. So there are situations that are like that. Uh, so I don't want you to think just because I, uh, I, I think unity is a great thing and it's God's will that it just means all inclusive. Doesn't matter who you are, what you do, I can be one with you because we can't. We can't be one with everybody. Uh, so I have this um, 
Uh, the group, I, I think I talked about, did I talk about the ministerium that I'm a part of? Yeah. Did I? Um, I can't be one with everybody in that group. So I'm not looking for unity in that group. That is not my ecclesia. <laughs> you know, there are some people within that group that I can be one with, but I can't be one with everybody. That doesn't mean I can't cooperate with them and be kind to them and be helpful. The thing is, a lot of times we think that if we don't agree with that person, we have to be unkind to that person. And we do that with, with all kinds of situations, but that's not scriptural. It's, it's never scriptural to be unkind. <laughs> it's never scriptural to, uh, it may be scriptural to separate from them and they may have a real difficult time understanding you, you're, you're being kind by doing that. But, but the things that I see sometimes on Facebook or, or they are me. And I think, how does that work out? Well, our response to anything if it's, conflicting with the divine nature of God, mm -hmm. it can never be right. 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 So it's all, even scripture, so, you know, when something is heretic or wrong, mm -hmm. it's because God will never violate his nature. Right. So when we mm -hmm. see something as an interpretation that violates the nature of God, we know something isn't right. Yeah. Right. God is love. Right. So if it violates love, if our re response, oh, that person's wrong, so I have to you know, that's wrong because that's not God's way of, that's not right. his nature. Right. I mean, uh, I don't think it happens now. I, who knows, it, maybe it does. But I'm early on in the, in, the, in the church as the church was growing, especially after, well, I think even Augustine was involved in some of this stuff. Um, they literally, um, okay, so let, let's skip past that and let's go to, um, when the Anglican Church was born. <laughs> um, the Anglican Church was the Church of England was born uh, because Henry VIII wanted to divorce his wife and he couldn't do it under the Catholic Church and so he started a new one. <laughs> and, um, and, but people that were in England that were, remained Catholic were now going to be burned at the stake because they were heretical <laughs> because they didn't, they weren't part of the Church of England. They were still Catholic. So, I mean, so too often, and, and, and even as late as the, um, uh, the Reformation, people were st would be killed by the church for not agreeing with the church. The witches in um, the North, the yeah. part here were, most, a lot of them were just people praying in tongues. Yeah, yeah. Encounters. So, so yeah, it's even the church, yeah, in that even stuff. as early as that, um, as recent as that, I can't find anywhere in the scripture in, in the new under the new covenant that it's okay to kill somebody that doesn't agree with you. Yeah. But it became part of the church practice to do that, and I think that is con now that in the way we respond to somebody being wrong can be just as wrong <laughs> as what they did or what they said or what they're teaching. We have to be so careful in how we respond and what feelings we allow to, to become part of our feelings toward that person or, you know, we, we, it's love. It always needs to be love when we're, even when we're dealing with, like, so when you discipline a child, you can discipline a child about, oh, out of love, out of anger, out of embarrassment, you know, your, your kid starts screaming at Walmart, you know, you get embarrassed. Now, are you going to dis discipline because you're embarrassed? <laughs> are you going to discipline your child because you love them and you know if they continue in that kind of behavior? Uh, most, most of the time, what I see is parents, and probably what I've done a time or two, I'm disciplining this child because I'm embarrassed, not because I've I'm worried about them. <laughs> I'm worried about me. And what are people going to think about me? Well, we do that within the church so often. We, it's what I feel and what I think. And we're not thinking about that other person. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
While we were yet sinners, Christ died. When we were shaking our fists at God and saying, I don't believe in you and I think you're, you know, you're rotten because you, you, know, you let my grandma die or whatever, whatever, whatever our reason. He said, but I'll still die for you. So if, if he's the head of this church, shouldn't we act like him? Yeah. <laughs> when, go ahead. It says, the scripture says, on the night he was betrayed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so the example there is even when someone's betraying you, right in that moment, your actions are still still to be Christ-like. You're still supposed to wash their feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You wash your feet on them, then he's betrayed. Yeah. And so you can't even remove a person because Jesus knew from the beginning yeah. that Jesus was due. And that's really the responsibility of, the, of an elders in the house. You don't remove them until God says so. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a time for everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, Judas had to fulfill his yeah. purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes God allows people in our midst so that we can learn how to deal with them correctly. Mm -hmm. How to love them unconditionally. Mm -hmm. You know, so... We still have to be submitted to Holy Spirit every time we correct somebody. It's Holy yeah. Spirit, you have to. If you're telling me to do this, then I got to do it. But if not, I got to cope with the people yeah. and their problems and their issues. You know? Yeah. If I, as a church leader, uh, want to get rid of somebody in the congregation that's causing an issue for me, or maybe they, I heard they were gossiping about me, and I go around the, you know, and I, I just deal with it myself. I've done, I'm, I'm just as wrong as they are. <laughs> you know? So, although these things happen, we have to be super careful on, uh, in the way that we deal with them. Um, the, the, the thing is, the reason we don't have to be afraid and deal with these things out of fear, and, and which is so much of what... And, and, oh, let me say this too. The, most of us, like if, if Mike Bickle is wrong... I have no, I have no say in what, what Mike Bickle does. Like I don't have a, I don't, I'm, I am not an influence in his life. I am not a, I am not an elder over him in any way. Um, so if I have an opinion about Mike Bickle or whoever, I just threw that out there because that was that was one, one of the people that somebody was telling me, oh, be careful, you know. Um, I really don't have a reason to say anything about Mike Bickle. And if I've got a group of people in, in the congregation that I'm serving that is, that is being influenced by, by Mike Bickle, or not, I, I won't use him anymore, I'll use somebody else, Joe Schmo. <laughs> There's no Joe Schmoes in here, right? Um, uh, and, and I believe that his influence on them is, is going to hurt them because there's a teaching, maybe, you know, so many, so many teachings out there that, that um, you know, might be hurtful, right? Um, then I should, I should talk to them about him. But there's no reason for me to put out on Facebook, <laughs> you know, I don't agree with so-and-so. So because I have it's... Mm -hmm. For one, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, maybe my opinion is not orthodox, you know. Um, but I'll also... What, does, what good does it do? It just shows the world how divided we can be. <laughs> and I think, oh, we work so, 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 probably a lot of times unknowingly, we show the world our worst side as a church, where they're supposed to know we're his disciples because of the love we have for one another. And instead, we throw our opinions out there when we really, there's, there's no good that really can come out of it. You might find, so, you know, let's say you have a lot of Facebook friends and you find 500 people that can say, hey man, I agree with you. Yeah, he's a jerk. You know, well, what, good in the, what in the world good did that do anybody? Did, did, that, have, did that help correct that person? No, because they'll probably never see, <laughs> you know. If you sent them a private message, maybe, maybe that, that 
could be one of the things that you could do if you really felt like that person um, was was off base and you and and you felt like you're sending them a private message of some sort might help correct them and bring them back into line then then do that but don't involve everybody else and there was never it, it's never the right thing to do but we do it all the time so when we're talking about unity and becoming one we have to be careful not to do the things that work against unity they work against oneness. The cool thing is that God's given us protection against these kinds of things. He gave us some instructions. Most of us in the church are, are probably, unless we become an elder of some sort, we're probably not going to be too involved unless, you know, maybe the whole congregation in, in Matthew 18, it says, you know, you go to them, then you take some elders, and then you involve the whole church. And the church in consensus, I, I, like I said, I've never seen this happen, but in consensus, the church comes together and in love mm -hmm. deals with, with the matter, with, with that person. Um, I, did, I did it. Huh? I did it a couple weeks. Good. I felt that the uh, wrong that I made in a word that I said, comment that I made, was a bit divisive. Okay. Could be divisive because it was a bit too political. Okay. And I never want to be divisive in that way. And so I offended somebody, and in realizing the offense, they wouldn't approach me. So they didn't go far right. after 18, but I chose to right. say, you know what? What I said could have affected this entire group. Right. So I will apologize publicly Good. to the congregation. Beautiful, beautiful. If it just affected what a great person, example. that person. You know, who it affects. Right, that's right. You deal with. Yeah, yeah. Good. And that's how we should do it. It's, it's actually, it's not really all that hard. I mean, to follow what the scripture says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? If, anyway. <laughs> um, so we do have some protections that God has given us. He's given us the discerning of spirits. <laughs> it's, a, it's a spiritual gift that we can have. And discerning of spirits is not the gift of criticism. Because <laughs> I've seen a lot of people, or, or, or enough people, let's say, within the church in my years that thought they had the gift of discernment, they called it. Um, and really, they were just critical people that, that thought a lot of things were bad. And you, know, they, you, you never really heard them say... <laughs> well, I really see the power of God in that situation, or I see the love of God in that situation, or I, you know, I feel the spirit in that situation. Most of the time, their discernment worked in the negative and something they didn't really like, or, and, and um, that's, that's, when their, that's when their gift uh, came alive. <laughs> you know? um, and there aren't that many people that I've known that I've known they have the gift of discerning spirits. I think it's one of the uh, necessary gifts that we should ask for. Um, the thing is, sometimes it's actually a little scary because I, I, you know, I've read I've, I've read about different people that have that gift of discerning of spirits, and it actually gets a little overwhelming and a little scary sometimes because they literally see the spirit uh, that are that that's with. The, the people like you know they might have a flame or something or brightness or a glow or they might have a serpent wrapped around them or or those kinds of things and that can get a little scary but if you're dealing with a, a with a matter ask God for the church Jesus used it all the time he said you know one moment Peter was saying the right thing and he's like upon this rock I'm going to build my church and you know, only the Father would have given you that, that revelation. And, and, you know, awesome. And then a couple lines later, he's like, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> because you're thinking of things of men and not of things of God. And he, he was off. And Jesus knew it. Mm. You know, he wasn't off because Jesus didn't like what he had to say. Mm. He was off because Jesus discerned the spirit that was, and it was a, a fleshly spirit. You know, I, I, you know, it didn't say what the spirit was. Um, I usually, I, I, for a long time, con, uh, 
combine that story with the story of when the disciples wanted to call fire down from heaven on, on yes. Samaria because they didn't want Jesus to come. And uh, he, said, he said, you don't know what spirit you're of, you know. Mm. Um, but Jesus knew what spirit they were of, but they didn't know what spirit they were of. And you know what? Jesus loved them even when he was correcting them in those kind of, I mean, I think it would be hard to correct somebody and say, get behind me, Satan, <laughs> to somebody. Um, and, and if you had a really strong gift of discerning of spirits, and you knew what was spirit was speaking through them, and, and you, like he had been, he had spent a lot of time with these guys, so, you know, he, you know, he had built a relationship with them. They knew he loved them. So, you know, you do have to have, I think, a, a pretty good relationship with somebody to address them in the same way that Jesus addressed those people. But we should be able to have discerning of spirits for these things. When somebody comes into our, our group of people, whether it's our congregation on a Sunday or whether it's a small group or whatever, and you know what? Being suspicious of somebody is not discerning of spirits. <laughs> You know, I don't know this person. I, you know, they don't dress the way I think they ought to, or they, they, whatever. Whatever our problem is, we need to ask for a discerning of spirits for that. We're, the church is, I mean, is not really good at, at uh, allowing new people sometimes to come <laughs> and be part of their group. You know, I, I've heard it many, many times over the years about how, you know, oh, well, this, this church is clicky and this church is that. And, and you know, I, I took a, a course one time on, on how to, um, how to um, do small groups. And one of the things was to break the small group up, like have, have semesters because small groups become very clicky after a while. If, if the same group of people is together for, for a long time, it's really hard for somebody else to become part of that group. I, I've seen it in a lot. Of, I, I'm sure not every church is that way, but I've seen it a lot and too much. Um, we're suspicious of people that aren't like us or, or we don't, for whatever reason, you know, that's not discerning. It's not the same as discerning of spirits. But we can have the gift of discerning and we can know What's going on? What spirit is behind this? Is this a spirit from God or is this not? And when that happens, we don't necessarily have to immediately address it, but to be aware if you're, if you're a leader or something in that group, or even if you're not, you know, be aware of it. Make, make, maybe the leader doesn't have a gift of discerning experience or isn't exercising that gift. Maybe it's, say, you know, I felt the Holy Spirit, you know, but please don't do it because you, you, you have some sort of suspicion about them because, you know, you know their grandmother or, you know, or whatever, you know. Um, let it be a spiritual gift at, to discern the spirit that's behind it. Because they could be one moment having a very, pow saying something very powerful like Peter, and the next moment they might, it doesn't mean they're a bad person. They might just not have the right spirit when they're, when they're saying some particular thing. Maybe they, maybe they hurt in a certain area or whoever, who knows what. Peter, what Peter said was not a mean thing, was not a bad thing. And I think probably the rest of the disciples would have agreed with him. You know, oh, no, we can't have you going to the cross, for goodness sake. What's, <laughs> you know, because they didn't have a clue what was going on. But Jesus knew, he understood. And he understood what spirit was behind that. It wasn't the spirit of God that was speaking through him at that time. Um, so, so it's not always obvious when someone, uh, when, when there's a, a, a spirit that's not from God involved in the situation, but God has given us a gift to help protect us. We don't have to operate in fear because even... I, it, it doesn't say this in 1 Corinthians 13, but I, thi I think it would fit. You can have the gift of discerning of spirits, but if you have not love, <laughs> you know, all of it has to operate in love. All of it has to operate in love. Also, he gives us wisdom, you know, and again, you know, I remember, I remember as a kid, 
you know, already like a, a teenager, a young teenager, uh, recognizing that common sense wasn't always God's sense, <laughs> you know, and and saying to my dad, which is probably not a great idea, but I was saying to my dad, you know, uh, just because it's common sense doesn't <laughs> doesn't mean that God that's what God wants, you know. <laughs> um, because, yeah, right? But there's godly wisdom. Wisdom from above. Now, we, we can recognize godly wisdom when we see it. Because we have a description in James. Wisdom from above is peaceable and, and whatever. I forget the other words. <laughs> you can look it up. <laughs> wisdom from above. Um, so he gives us wisdom for situations. Uh, we don't have to rely on our fears to help to help us decide what to do about a person or a group of people that we're encountering in the body of Christ. Fear is never going to give you the right answer, but wisdom will, discerning of spirits will. Um, always, and, and Josh said it already, but always, uh, if it's not love. It's, it's not worth it. It's not, it's not something we should be operating in and, and relying on. Sometimes we have personal passions. So those are all things kind of that, that when there's a real problem, God gives us tools to deal with real problems within the church. Not everybody that walks into a church building or not everybody that says, I'm, I'm part of the church or I'm part of the body of Christ is part of the body of Christ. I mean, we, we can have, um, I, I remember studying um, about just church safety and things like that one time, and uh, I remember a story about a guy who wore his Royal Ranger uniform, and because they needed Royal Ranger leaders, and a guy had a Royal Ranger uniform, they, they put him in Royal Rangers as a leader. And he was not a good person. Discerning his spirits is where, like, he looked like a good person. And they probably needed help. And he was probably great to, you know, fit the bill. Oh, it's an answer to prayer. We need the gift of discerning of spirits because sometimes things have to be dealt with. It's, it's real. But I think we've allowed those things to keep us divided in, in, in a lot of ways because, oh, this person's a heretic or this person's a that, this person's that. And it's really has more to do with our personal passions and our personal understanding than it does with or orthodox teaching in the Word of God. So sometimes we have very personal things that, that we're passionate about. I'm passionate about unity, right? Okay, that's why I'm teaching this course. But if somebody's not passionate and, 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 they're, and they don't think, well, you know, I don't know about this ecumenism and, and what about the... And, that doesn't make them my enemy. They may see themselves as my enemy, but, but I don't have to see them as an enemy. I can love them just as much because they don't have the same passion that I have. Because the Bible doesn't command us to, I mean, we can see it's God's will, but it's not like, it's not in, it's not in the creed, right? <laughs> you know, well, if you're not, if you're not, being loving toward people, we're going to get rid of you. <laughs> you know, if it was, we probably wouldn't have a church, I guess. You know, because a lot of the church hasn't been loving toward each other. Um, but um, don't let your personal passion divide you from somebody else in the body of Christ that has a different kind of passion. Uh, for the, in in the um, so so in the fivefold ministry, and I know you've had classes on that. Uh, when an evangelist is going to be very passionate about evangelism. And if you're not as passionate about, evangel about evangelism, because they might say something like, well, that's, that's what it's all about. Souls. And, and probably nobody would disagree with that necessarily. But your passion may not be souls. And, and I'm... I'm you all have to love me. I've already taught you that, right? Even if you don't agree with what I say. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, maybe your passion is making sure, maybe your passion is, is, is theology. You know? 
And, and you want to make sure, you're a teacher. You're not an evangelist. You're a teacher. And you want to make sure everything, everything gets done right and said right. And, and all the classes are taught right and they're taught by the right people. And really, yes, yeah, souls are important, but you know, they're not all that. I mean, they're, yes, they're important, but we need to make sure that we're discipling people for goodness sake. You know, you can't just, just get a bunch of people saved and not do anything with them. You've got to disciple them. <laughs> you know, and maybe that's, does that make us incompatible? We can let it make us incompatible. So we have to honor, uh, I think it's Alan Hirsch, uh, talks about the fivefold ministry, and he talks about um, his, his thought on it is that everybody's bent in, toward one of these five gifts. They may not be an apostle or a prophet, you know, but they're bent toward that. So, so what I've recognized is that there's churches led by apostles. There's churches led by pastors. There's churches led by teachers. There's churches led by evangelists. And there's churches led by prophets. Most of them are all called pastor. <laughs> but there, when, when I look at a, a, a church and I sort of analyze it, sometimes I can tell that church is led by an evangelist. A lot of churches are led by evangelists, actually. And a lot of times, they're bringing people in like crazy. They're doing their... They have all the lights and the, they have everything they need to attract people to, to this building because souls and having people pray that prayer is the most important thing to them. They have no clue about how to disciple people. But because they're the pastor and because of the way we've, we've done it... <laughs> You know, people expect them to be able to disciple people, but they, they can't. They, they have no clue. They know how to get people in the door, and they know how to get them to a point where they will pray a prayer. But they don't know what to do with them after that. <laughs> and they need people on their team. So we need to be able to get along as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. One of, one of the chapters in my book is the Fellowship of the Eldership. Because often, if, if I'm a leader of a church and I'm an evangelist, I don't really want to hear about all that other stuff. I just, souls is the most important thing. Or if I'm a prophet, I'm going to attract a lot of prophetic people to myself. And if all we have is a bunch of people prophesying to each other, we're really not getting a whole lot done. It might be wonderful prophecy. You might feel wonderful when you leave. But if there's not an expression of, of, of all five, so all I'm saying is that especially these people that, that are in these places of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, they can be very passionate. And the people that are attracted to them can be very passionate about that one thing. And it can actually cause division in the, in the church because they don't recognize that all those other things are just as important. It may not be their thing. They don't have to do it necessarily, but it's just as important. Because if you get a bunch of people in, we are called to make disciples, <laughs> right? So that's, what, that's, that's the scripture for the, for the teacher. We gotta make some disciples, you know? We gotta teach them. I don't know how to get them here, but once they, you know, <laughs> but we gotta teach them. We gotta make sure they, you know, they're, they're of sound doctrine. You know, we got to make sure people are connected to God. We got to make sure that the supernatural is happening. I can tell you, um, when when uh, when I was pastoring a church and I, I met Les Tomlinson. I don't know if I shared that story with you or not in this class or not, but um, Les and I hit it off immediately. The first night we met, we spent probably five hours together, or maybe even more than that, and till the middle of the morning just talking about stuff because I knew very little about prophecy. I just was afraid of prophets for the most part. That's what I was. That's what I learned about prophecy. You got to watch out for those prophets. <laughs> They'll mess everything up, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, and what I saw, as I allowed the gift of prophet, uh, the spiritual gift to be released into the spiritual house of that con of that particular body, I saw the gifts increase within the body. That's what I saw happen. 
yeah, there were some prophetic words, more so than there were, um, there had been before. But it wasn't just about the prophetic words. It was about, for, for me, this is my understanding of it, as the gift of prophet is released to, to a group of people, the spiritual gifts rise up. Mm-hmm. And to me, and then, and then you've got a pastor and a teacher also to kind of help those things be. And, you know, I don't like the word balance usually within the church because usually it means that you're, you're um, I don't like, um, whoever's using the word doesn't like the balance that's there. <laughs> 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 you, you know, she's, well, we need balance. <laughs> you know? um, but I, I think when you have the full fivefold operating in a congregation, you're going to have good balance. Each of the fivefold, uh, each of those aspects of, of spiritual growth are necessary for uh, any believer to be balanced in their, in their growth and in their development as, as a believer. Um, so, passions. Sometimes we have to guard ourselves against some, if somebody else's passion is different than your passion, it doesn't mean you're right and they're wrong or they're right and you're wrong. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we, we get that all mixed up in, in our growing together as a body and we think, well, because they don't, they don't do enough prophecy, uh, you know, they're off. They, they, they don't have enough healing going on. You know, they're, they're off. They don't teach enough. You know, they're off. Um, don't, don't let that happen. Recognize that in the body of Christ, there's at least five <laughs> passions and five emphasis. Emphases? <laughs> Emphasis? <laughs> there's five of them. Uh, that are really important for the body of Christ. And there's people that are in those areas of, of, to develop the, con- the congregation, and their passion is one of those things. It doesn't make the other four less important or wrong. Let's take a break. The next part I'm going to use, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to reference s- some more scriptures, and we're going to look at them a, a little bit. Um, Uh, Romans 14 is one I'm going to look at. Uh, I'm going to read from... Well, I'll let you know because I don't know if I saved the New Living Translation on this. I could read it from my phone. You know what? That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read from my phone. Um, I do, but I don't have internet. On, like I'm not connected to anything, so. Um, no, 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 no. Sorry. Romans 14. You got it? Yeah, I think so. Last week I sat the whole time and I felt stiffer (laughs) when I got up so I thought well I'll try to stand this this week (laughs) I've been I've been writing my uh my did I already tell you that I've been riding my stationary bike um trying to get 10 miles in a day just because um (laughs) I need to get my body working you know again and and um what it does because I guess because of um uh, I, I don't even know. It's called uh, hem- deprivation. Yes, hemisensory deprivation. Now you know. Um, I, I get, rather than feeling sore, I just get stiffer. <laughs> so it feels worse, even though I think it's actually doing good stuff. So, you know, please uh, pray that it is doing good stuff. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, this is, oh, I have, I've never even read it in the Passion Translation. Um, eh, why not? Uh, offer an open hand of fellowship and to welcome every true believer, even though their faith may be weak and immature, and refuse to engage in debates with them concerning nothing more than opinions. 
<laughs> I like how the Passion Translation put that. <laughs> um, so when we, when we have an opinion, say it's, say it's a political opinion, <laughs> you know, since tomorrow's an election, um, people can get really, really ugly yeah. over these things. And um, they can be so passionate about what they believe to be the right thing politically. They can overlook loads of stuff <laughs> within their opinion. <laughs> and they can totally be nasty <laughs> to people that don't have that same opinion. I, I've literally had, I literally had people come to me before and ask me as the, as the pastor in a congregation I, I pastored, um, well, what are you going to do about the election? And I said, well, you know, I'm going to encourage people to pray and vote according to what the Holy Spirit tells them. They're like, that's not good enough, pastor. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so, unfortunately, they also took it into their hands to inform people. And literally, were unkind to people over a political matter. I, I do believe because we live in America and because we have the ability to cast a vote, that we should vote. I was talking to a friend of mine who's, who's Democratic Who's, who has been in political office and, and serves different communities uh, politically pastor. and is a pastor. Yeah, a, a Democratic pastor. Mm -hmm. I had a relative of mine tell me, right? Right? I, ha I had a... Not very, very few Caucasians. I had, and, this, and, and Caucasians. All Caucasians. And Caucasians, wow. right? I, I literally had a family member tell me one time at some family dinner we had, um, now wonders why we don't want to hang out a lot. But you can't be a Democrat and be a Christian. And I thought, what? who in the world gave you the right to decide that? You know? um, anyway, um, we prayed in a house this week. Uh, our friend Elaine Santos' home, who's, who's Republican, whose son is a Democratic councilman. We... The mayor, or not the mayor, the governor was coming to their house on Sunday. It's amazing. Um, and we were invited to come pray. We didn't come to the Sunday thing, but we came ahead of time to pray over the home, that the presence of God would be there. We prayed for the governor. You know, you don't have to agree with somebody in every way. I, I don't know. I don't know if there's any politician. I've, I know that I agreed with everything that they thought or did or said. Um, Republican or Democrat or, or independent or whatever. All I can say is these are disputable matters and the Bible talks about disputable matters and it says that you're not necessarily going to agree with everybody but treat them as a true brother and say, if they're a true believer and, they're, and, and listen you, you can't have the idea that they can't be a true believer if they're not your in your political party <laughs> whatever. You know, I, I mean, that was one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard out of, out of a family member, what, you know, not my immediate family, <laughs> um, that you can't be a Christian and be this or that. And I thought, this is crazy. There's a lot, a lot of disputable matters in the body of Christ, things we don't see eye to eye on. I mean... Some are, some we might think are important things. But there still might be a disputable thing. There still might be something that's debatable. And so debate on it. You know, have, we should be able to have a lively discussion. I, 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 I like the ministerium that I'm a part of. Like I said, we can't, we can't be in oneness because we're not all Christians, right? But, it's one of the most healthy groups I'm a part of because they can passionately share their opinion, opposing opinions about things, and we can all hug when we're getting ready to leave and not have 
bad feelings toward each other. I haven't actually seen that in a, in a church board meeting when there's opposing opinions uh, around the table. Usually you leave like, well, I just got to get out of here. <laughs> you know, that's not how we're supposed to be. We, we don't even have board meetings, so well, I love that. <laughs> um, but anyway, there's a lot of disputable matters. Read, read Romans 14. Read the whole thing. I'm not going to take the time because I'm, I'm running out of time. But um, all of Romans 14 really gives us you know, a, an example, some examples of what disputable matters look like and how we're supposed to deal with those kinds of things. It talks about food and, you know, uh, food and wine and, you know, different things like that. Those aren't the only disputable matters. They're, they're an example of what a disputable matter may be. And if you think about the culture that they were, that this letter was written to, that was a big deal at the time. Yeah. We, you know, you're not going to walk down the street and, and have some place selling food that was offered to an idol, more than likely. <laughs> but they had it all the time. Like it was, yeah, not, not, in, our, not in our area, as far as we know. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not an issue for us, but it was an issue. It was a big deal for them. So, so when you think of a disputable matter and what this is referring to, think of a big deal. Because it was a big deal to them. It, it was something they had to deal with daily. And when they went to the market to get their stuff, there was probably some stuff that had been offered to idols there. And so they were talking about these things as disputable matters and how to deal with them in the body of Christ in a healthy way. Uh, it's, one, it's one thing that, you know, when you're part of a multicultural church, like we are, mm -hmm. you, know, you have to be considerate of other people and try to view their world. Yeah. And, it, you know, that's the thing. When you're in a lot of cliques, you don't tend, even though you have people with different backgrounds around you, but you tend not to view things through their world. So the disputable issues become a big thing. And, you know, this is really the political, the biggest disputable issue is the politics. Yeah. Is, this whole, uh, you know, last few years has totally divided black and white. Yeah. We've had people leave, even this church, because of people's posts on Facebook and all that. They're so one way and not taking any time to consider what it's like to grow up a certain way, what, you yeah. know, just think about others. Think about God, other people. Earth. I have chosen not to put any, get involved in any political thing. Even when I said a statement, it really wasn't purposeful political. It wasn't trying to be divisive in any way, but I could understand how it came up that way. I was trying to help educate people that, okay, make America great again. If you're not Caucasian, that's a hard thing to understand because when was it so great for a person from a different background? Right. But... For somebody who's extreme, you know, conservative, <laughs> that's a no-no. So it's not even worth even saying that. But we all need to start thinking about others, and some things are just worth not. Right. Just pray. God will put the right person in. Yeah. You know. One of the great things is, is uh, uh, in Danny Silk's book, I think it's in Keep Your Love On, and it talks about the goal of communication is understanding, not necessarily agreement. Now, ultimately, we do want to come to some sort of agreement at, at some point as we continue to learn truth. But we're not at that we're not at that, at that stage of unity yet. But understanding is a really good step to begin to understand where people are coming from. We have friends from England that they they're like they can't. That Trump is just like for them, just like ridiculous like who is it? and he's a baptist pastor <laughs> you know and so so we we don't talk about that stuff very often there's no reason i actually don't talk about it much at all anyway but um there's a lot of disputable things and if we really seek to understand people that have a differing opinion we actually might learn something <laughs> you know we might learn that we we don't have a full understanding of the whole scope of things because we we probably don't. <laughs> um, so, um, other thing we can do is overlook faults. In Colossians 3, 12 to 15, it says, Since God chose you to be holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness. This Now, this 
if we were to describe the church during election season, probably we wouldn't use many of these words. But these are the words that are used in the scripture to describe the church. This is what we're supposed to look like, election season or not. <laughs> um, Tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. What? Aren't we supposed to call their faults out? <laughs> no, make allowances for each other's faults. And forgive anyone who offends you. That's just not our, usually our stance, but it's so plain and simple in the scripture. This is what we look like. This is what, uh, when, when we, when we, Describe the, the congregation, uh, the, the ecclesia. This is how it should be able to be described. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony, and let peace that comes from Christ rule your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Beautiful. What a beautiful description of the church. And that's the goal uh, is we're supposed to look like that. You know, Ephesians 4 talks about unity and talks about that, that until we all come to the unity of the faith, <laughs> you know, we're still in that process. But if we don't, as the church, begin to work toward that, recognize, you know, they say, you know, the first step in solving a problem is to recognize there is one. <laughs> you know, we have to recognize that there's something to do and there's a different way for us to act in the body of Christ in order for it to happen. The only thing we can do, and I think I said this the other week, is we can change and we can do something ourselves. We're not going to make the rest of it. We can't just complain about the church. Jesus loves the church. He loves his bride. It's beautiful to him. But he, just like we, we might look at our children sometimes and go, wow, this is not what I, my, what I planned for you. But I don't love them any less. <laughs> you know, I see so much more potential in you than what I'm, what, you know, than what I'm actually seeing happen. But I don't love you any less. <laughs> you know, and, um, and even though we may not be where we're supposed to be, let's, let's help the church go in that direction. We're supposed to look out for the needs of others even more than our own. Wow. Consider others, the scripture says, better than ourselves. That's a tall order, but it must be doable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Consider others better than yourselves, even if they have a different political opinion <laughs> or, or a different theological opinion or different doctrinal opinion. Consider others better than yourselves. Wow. Um, we've got the Beatitudes, you know. Tells us to turn the other cheek and give it, <laughs> you know, stuff that we like we it's almost like we read it because it sounds really nice but we sort of almost just let it just go over our heads as if it doesn't really apply to me because you know that was we never say that but we, sometimes we live that way and I, I what I want us to do is just be aware that we we are the ones that can change this the people that are aware are the ones that can change this when you have if there's a slight problem that you have with somebody else in the body of Christ, deal with it. Get it dealt with. Deal with it in yourself, at least, first. And if you can get over it, they may not even know you have a problem with them. It's maybe not even good to tell them you have a problem with them. If you can get over it and get past it, and then just move on and be loving toward them. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, all these kinds of love is patient, love is kind, love is, you know, this is, these are descriptions of us. You know, these are not some, oh, how in the world? It's a doable, possible thing. He sheds his love abroad in our hearts. He gives us everything we need for life and for godliness. There's no reason to be ungodly. <laughs> because everything we need to love, he's given us. Everything to look, overlook another's faults, he's given us. He's given us patience. You know, did we talk about that already? <laughs> He's given us patience. And um, sometimes we need patience. Sometimes we just, we just have to be patient <laughs> and get over whatever it is that's got under our skin. 
And some people think they're so spiritual by letting things get under their skin. And it's totally the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my goodness. There's really no room for, for division except those some uh, exceptions to, to the, the ideal of unity. There's some exceptions, but they're very specific and they're laid out in the scripture very clearly. And most of the things that divide us aren't in there. Yeah. So you can be friends. In, in case you didn't know, you can be friends with other denominations, other people that don't believe. Maybe they're not Pentecostal. Maybe they don't believe in healing. Maybe they're cessationists. I can be friends with cessationists? Yes, you can. You can love a cessationist. You can have, you can have a, um, a, a discussion with a cessationist. You can disagree with a cessationist and still love them. And I'm assuming everybody here is not cessationist. That's why I'm using that one. But, but uh, you know, because I, I, I'm, I'm assuming everybody here believes in healing and the gifts of the Spirit and all those kinds of things. There are people that don't in the body of Christ. Does that mean they're not part of the body of Christ? No. They have a different understanding. For who knows why? That doesn't make you better. It doesn't make you superior to them. Because there's probably something you do that they don't like. Besides speaking in tongues and praying for the sick. <laughs> sometimes they, we who speak in tongues and walk in power of God can be sometimes have less love than... Less they love. Are yes. Sometimes, sometimes people that are charismatic are less loving than because we, we've got it all figured out. We're we're at the, we're at the top of the uh, of the game here. Uh, when we were we were um, working on uh, merging together with a evangelical church, in a sense, I don't want we weren't becoming one church, but we were we were cross-pollinating is, like, is the word I like to use. I was good friends with the pastor and still am. Just had coffee with him today. Um, uh, he's actually the Caucasian Democratic oh, political yeah. guy. <laughs> um, um, and I remember having dialogues with him before we were, he wanted us to come speak there sometimes and he wanted to come speak and we wanted to try to cross pollinate because they they saw that we had something that they that some of the people in the con congregation were desiring um, but I noticed I had to recognize and I recognized in myself and in some people in, in, in our congregation that we felt superior to them mm. we felt like well we we're a little further along than, than you are. So it, it's really not, I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but it's really nice of us to bow down to and come down to your level to help bring you up to ours. Right? It, it was a little bit like that. We didn't want to feel that way, but, but I recognized it as, as we were trying to develop, and I had to get rid of that. And I had to think about what is going on in my mind and in my heart as this is as, as this is happening there's not there's if I would have come in there as the one that knew everything because you know we were charismatic <laughs> and you guys aren't and some of you don't even know much about the Holy Spirit why would they even want to listen to me <laughs> If we have love, we can have all knowledge, right? First Corinthians 13. And if we don't have love, we can prophesy accurately. Really great prophecies. But if we have not love. So we have to, we have to evaluate ourselves so often as we're growing in Christ. Am I still being loving to people who haven't? Like, I, I, I've, I've probably done it myself too, but I've, I've observed people that have grown in a certain area and, and have gotten to a certain, 
And, and they can't understand why in the world is this person acting this way. Well, well, a year ago, you were acting the same exact way. Yeah, they just haven't come into the same, in the same revelation as you have at the same time. Were you a horrible person when, <laughs> a year ago and you didn't, you didn't understand that? <laughs> you know, we just have to be loving and patient and kind with people um, uh, in the body of Christ, no matter where they are. Uh, um, uh, oh my goodness, let's see. I still have a few more notes here. Um, so, one of the, w what I see, and I think I mentioned this briefly the other day, as one of the, one of the ultimate goals um, is that we would, in the body of Christ, be able to share the a Eucharistic meal together, the communion together, the Lord's Supper. Um, because, really, in, in most churches, most Christian churches, that's one thing we do have in common. We all do communion in one way or another. We might do it once a week or once a year or one, every day or, or once a month or whatever it might be. We, but somehow we do. We might dip it in, what do they call it, tincture or whatever. We might dip our bread in the, in the wine and, and then take it that way. Or we might take it, have a cracker or a wafer or, or whatever. We might do it a lot of different ways, but somehow we do it. And that is also the one thing that when you come into some churches... That if you weren't baptized in that church, you don't get to do that with that group of people. And, and it's not just the Catholic Church. It's several churches that I've been in. Uh, over, what's that? Lutheran church. The Lutheran church. Yeah. Because there's something in, in their, in their um, ecclesiology, <laughs> the way they do church, <laughs> Um, that told them, in their tradition, let's say, uh, that told them, if they're not baptized in here, um, they use the scripture in Corinthians that, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read. Um, they use that to say, well, you don't want to take the, the communion unworthily. You don't want to take it unworthily. So if, I, if you weren't baptized in, in the Lutheran church or the Catholic church or the Baptist church or the whatever church it might be, um, we don't want you to drink this or take this unworthily. We're not so sure about you, your salvation is really what they're saying, right? Um, and I guess to some degree, it's they're, they're trying to help you not drink damnation on yourself, you know? <laughs> Eat and drink damnation on yourself, right? You know, if, if you're not... You know, because that's how they interpret that, that scripture. Um, so I suppose maybe when they made that rule or, or began that tradition, it was, it was to help somebody not drink their way to hell, you know. I, I think there probably was a, was, was a, a good reason for it. But, but it has become a divisive thing rather than a unifying thing. And... I, I, I'm going to prove to you from Scripture that communion is supposed to be a unifying thing. And that's what 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11 uh, talk about. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which I don't remember ever hearing. I, I'm sure probably somebody said it because I uh, obviously uh, wouldn't remember every time that communion was shared, the Scripture. But usually it was 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, and it was usually very formal. And it was usually... We did these, these things that, that <laughs> I don't think Paul had in mind at all. Um, uh, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, So my dear friends, verse 14, So my dear friends, free from the worship, flee from the worship of idols. You are reasonable people. Decide for yourselves if what I'm saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? And though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people in Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? When we take that bread, as I grew up, and I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just saying I don't think it was the whole story. The bread was always used, mostly used, it was about healing. 
whose body was broken for you so you would be healed. I, you know, I don't think that that was, well, I know it's not the full expression. I don't know that it was even the, the most important <laughs> reason for the bread, the body of Christ, which is what the church is called. He says, we're eating from the same loaf. Doesn't that mean we're one body? So I have often, because when we do communion, we, we do it different like every time. <laughs> Some, somehow different, you know. Um, because there's so much in this meal that's just so amazing and awesome that I can't just do it one way. I mean, you know, you've been, <laughs> you've been there. I can't just focus on one thing. But very often, I, I remind the congregation that while you're eating this loaf, while you're eating this piece of matzah, which is what we use because it's the right thing to use. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Teasing. <laughs> um, we, um, so when we take our, I, I often remind them, why, when you eat this, you're saying, I don't have any issue with anybody else in the body of Christ. I'm one with them. I don't have any issues. And if you're, <laughs> if you're, if you're taking that, I don't do it to condemn anybody. I just want to remind them that that's what we're saying. That's what the scripture says we're saying. It unifies us. This bread unifies us. So, I want you to remember that. So the ultimate, I feel like one of the ultimate goals in unity is that we could receive the the. Communion, be at the communion table together, receive the Eucharist together, take the Lord's Supper together. Whether it's, you know, whatever it is, whether it's a, one of those little fishies or, you know, crackers or whatever, whatever it is, when we take it, recognize that the reality of what we're saying is that I'm one with everyone else in the body of Christ. Doesn't matter what political party, what nationality, what, what color, what what language they speak, how old they are, how young they are, whatever. Because we know there's no slave, there's no free, there's no Jew, there's no Greek, there's no male, there's no female in the one man, in the one body of Christ. Where we are saying that we're one. And when we're taking this meal, it's so, to me, so important that we recognize that this meal is talking about our oneness. And I believe the blood, in, in many ways, talks about our oneness with, with God. Because of Christ's blood, that's what makes us able to be one with God. And this whole meal, to me, is at least about our oneness. It may be about other things, too. And I'm so thankful for everything that Jesus did when, when he died on the cross and shed his blood and his body was bruised for us. But I can tell you, one of the things that this meal is about is about our oneness. And one of the things, I don't know what I think about the Pope, um, but I remember at the beginning of, of his popedom, whatever it's called, um, he was talking about that. He was meeting with the Orthodox leaders um, and he was meeting with different ones and he literally said and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not quoting but, uh, but, I, but I remember reading that it was his diet desire to, for us to receive the Eucharist together and that just made my heart just jump I, I love that thought because that's, that's the thing my friends that are in ecumenical community which where there, there's Catholic and Protestants in this community, um, they don't receive the Eucharist together. That's the one thing they don't do together. They worship together. They do all everything together, but they don't have mass, share mass together. The the Protestants have their Protestant service and their and and have their communion there, and the Catholics have their. And it's so sad to me that they can do everything else together, but. But our religious practice keeps us from being one, <laughs> you know? And I think that, and, and when I see this, it, it, just, it just makes me, we've got we've to gotta, we've gotta recognize 
what God's will and God's purpose for his church is. And if we can break down some of those walls, we're going to see the glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth in a way we've never seen it before. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But, you know, for the most part of my growing up in church, it was all about how we do communion. Um, and, and the form and the scriptures that we read for communion. And we read the scripture about the bread, and we take the bread, and we read the scripture about, about the, the blood, uh, the wine, and we, and we take the wine. And we usually, I don't know if you do it this way, and I'm, I'm not trying to change any, what, the way anybody does anything necessarily, but um, we used to say, okay, let's just, exa- let's just quiet, and let's just examine ourselves. And that's when, uh, what I noticed, people that felt like maybe they had sinned against Jesus in some way, or sinned against, sinned <laughs> in some way, would refuse to take communion. I do, I do not believe that that's what that's saying, because <laughs> if you're a Christian, your sins, past, present, and future, are covered by the blood of Christ. He didn't have to die again for you to, 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 for you to get right. You repent and then go and move on. You, you don't have to stop and not take communion. I, I don't believe that. I, we can d- dialogue and debate about it if we need to. But, um, uh, and, and, and I could be wrong, but I'm probably not. Um, <laughs> if we believe in grace, you're right. If we believe in works, exactly. <laughs> But, but that's what we taught. Even though we believed in grace, or at least we taught that we believed in grace, we still allowed people in our congregation to, to think that it was better if they didn't receive communion if you, if you sin this week or this month or whatever. And I'm thinking if you're waiting for communion to get your life right with Jesus, for goodness sake, let's do it every day. You know, because you just, you know, um, if that's what that's for. Then now that was, that was brought over from the Catholic Church and they did the confession and then they could take communion, right? Uh, and, but I don't think it was brought over from Scripture. <laughs> you know, I, I don't see that. When you read the whole thing, that whole passage is talking about how they were treating each other. And he said, he said, uh, I shouldn't have started this, um, but I have to. Um, But in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. What a scary thing to hear. (laughs) It wasn't about this is how we're supposed to, this is our form for communion, and let's make sure we get it right, because if we don't get it right, you know, we're going to, we're drinking damnation on ourselves. He said, you're not discerning the Lord's body. Who's the Lord's body? We're the Lord's body. <laughs> he said, you're not discerning the Lord's body. That's what the problem is. And then he goes on and he get, and goes into more detail. And he says, some of you are eating like pigs. And some of you are getting drunk. And others of you are going without. And you're thinking that's okay? So you're saying, by taking this meal together, I'm one with you. I love you. But you're saying on the other side, with this meal, because it wasn't just a a little cracker and a a little cup. You're also saying with the meal, well, I'm not sharing with you. (laughs) And so he says, hey, listen, if you you like to eat a lot, eat eat, eat at home before you come. And then just eat a little bit together so you can share with other people. (laughs) He He was addressing their treatment of one another. He was saying, it's better if you didn't even meet together. <laughs> now, we would never stop doing that with that, right? Let's not meet together. But he's saying, if you're going to meet together, do it, do it in love. Let me, show, let me tell you exactly. Because when, you meet, when they met together, it, it tells us in, in Acts chapter 2, all believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. 
A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Shared everything they had. This is the, this is the kind of life that, that God expects, the kind of attitude, let's say. Let, 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 you know, I hate to, to put disclaimers in the scripture because I don't think they, it really needs them. <laughs> but the attitude they had toward one another was, I'll sell my house if you, if you need something. Yeah. You know? That's, that's, that's the right attitude they were supposed to have. And what was happening in Corinth was they weren't having that attitude. I won't even share my meal with you if you don't have, if you don't have a meal. And he was correcting that. That's, and so when we receive communion together, I hope, I hope that, that if nothing else, you take this away from this class. When you're receiving communion, when you're taking that bread, you're saying to all the body of Christ in the whole world, I'm one with you. I love you. I know there might be differences in what we think and how we, how we interpret some scriptures, but I love you. We are the body of Christ. That's, that's what I, that's, that's when we're taking that meal, we're taking that with the whole body of Christ. Even if they wouldn't let you take it, don't be offended. Don't be offended if you go to a church and they don't let you take it. Take it at home and, and take it as if you were there. And love them. Even if they didn't let you take it. Even if you felt like, well, I'm, I'm a Christian. That's, forget that nonsense. It doesn't matter when you take the meal or how, you know. Submit to those who are in authority in that, in that particular situation and, and deal with it. And if communion is so important to you, and it should be, take it when you get home. And say, you know what, I'm taking this with that body. I love those people. I love that pastor, that leader who wouldn't let me take communion with that. I love him, her, whatever. Oh. <laughs> conclusion. Okay, I'm at the conclusion. I'm not going to close four times. Um, so, unity does transform the community. It, it transforms the community inside and outside. We, when we love each other the way we're, we're called to love and the way we're equipped to love each other and the way we're instructed to love and in fact the way we're commanded to love each other. When we do it, when we follow the command of Christ to love one another the way we should, the community is going to be transformed. The church, the ecclesia, is going to be transformed. It's going to be very different. They will know we are Christians or disciples by the love that we have for one another. We have to keep that. That should be one of the things we keep in the forefront of our mind. Because the world is watching. And I'm, I'm embarrassed Sometimes, I'm still one with them, but I'm embarrassed by some of them. <laughs> when we come to uh, an election season or, or whatever it might be that might divide us, and, and we see that, that we're not acting the way Christ intended it for us to act toward one another. Unity will transform. It will transform. The power that will come from a unified body, if two of Two or three agree is touching any one thing and it shall be done. What if the whole body of Christ agreed as it touching any one thing? What if we could have one voice about anything? It would be the most powerful voice on earth. Instead, we don't usually have one voice. And so we're not as powerful as we could be as the body of Christ. We are the bride, we're the family, we're the body. All these things that, that, that um, the, the scripture describes us as, if you divided any of those things, it would be a mess and it would be ugly. <laughs> because his design and his plan is for us to be one. The world will know, we, oh, I already said that. Um, and the ecclesia is the answer to all the problems the world faces. Every problem that's in, that's in the world, whether it's hunger, whether it's disease, wh whether it's, it's ho homelessness or, or, or children without parents, any of those kinds of things, we are the answer to that. And if we were working together, 
we could actually bring a solution to most of those things wouldn't even be a problem in the world anymore, truthfully. We read a, I read a book uh, many years ago called Radical Hospitality, and it, it talked about um, if every church, every congregation, took in 10 homeless people, there would be no homelessness in the world. <laughs> you know, I just remember that, 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 that idea, and I thought, it's true. And if every church fed 10 people that needed, needed food, or, or however many people they could, you know, if, because we have it, we have the resources to do everything that needs to be done. I re, uh, um, uh, Dina, Dina Van Hall, I uh, was listening to her the other day. They have an orphanage in China. And she said, and I might, maybe I said this the other day, um, but she said, you know, people come to me and ask me, well, um, well how, if God's a loving God, how come he lets this and that and the other thing happen? And she said, I really think it's because we hold the answer, we hold the solution, and we, and we don't release the solution to the world. We, we, we are the solution. We are the answer to those prayers to help for people to, to, to have enough food, to have enough of it, or whatever it is they need. But we're not working together, so it's, it's not happening yet. But I, I have hope that the church is going to be one. Like, like I mean, we're, we're called one. I, I have hope that the potential... And the, uh, that is within the body of Christ is, and I see it, and I'm excited about this meeting coming up in, De in December here, mm -hmm. and, and the meetings like it that are going on all over the world. This is one of the greatest things. And make sure you're praying for the, pray for unity in the body of Christ. And be part of the solution for unity in the body of Christ. I think that's all I'm going to say. So, Thanks so much. I enjoyed I, I enjoyed being here with all of you, and I appreciate you coming out. A couple announcements, everybody. First of all, just